the unloading valves. We remember that we may extend the first line as far as the casing operating pressure to locate the first valve. Now we turn to the manufacturer's catalogs to select the unloading and operating valves according to our design. Before completing our system design, we must also make sure that there is sufficient gas volume and pressure to meet operating conditions. And finally, that we are able to modify the design as inflow performance characteristics change. You should refer to the complete design shown in your manual to see how these considerations are taken into account. Before discussing intermittent gas lift design, please turn off the tape and work exercise 5.9 in your workbook. We continue our design of gas lift installations by turning now to intermittent flow systems. You'll remember that during intermittent gas lift, liquid is allowed to accumulate in the tubing above the gas lift valve. On a cyclic basis, the liquid is lifted to the surface in a slug or piston form by the injection of a high pressure gas below the slug. The injected gas expands and displaces the slug to the surface. Intermittent gas lift operation then is a cyclic operation and the cycle can be divided into three periods the inflow period, the lift period, and the pressure reduction period. The inflow period occurs when fluid flows from the formation into the well bore and collects in the tubing above the gas lift valve. The lift period begins when a sufficient volume of liquid has accumulated and gas is injected through the operating valve to lift the slug to the surface. The pressure reduction period begins after the gas slug reaches the surface and the gas lift valve closes. During this period, the lift gas pressure is dissipated, allowing the inflow period to begin again. If we plot the pressure at the operating valve versus time, it looks like this. In this case, the inflow period builds the pressure to about 550 psi. Gas is then injected and the liquid slug is displaced to the surface. The pressure reaches a maximum value of 750 psi and then decreases slightly during the slug movement. In this case, the lift period lasts for about eight minutes. The valve then closes, the pressure reduction period begins, and continues until the pressure drops below 300 psi. At that point, inflow from the formation begins again. The time between lifts for this system is about 38 minutes. We see then that the intermittent cycle is controlled by regulating the frequency of injection, the gas flow rate during injection, and the total quantity of gas injected during each lift period. Maximum production from intermittent lift will occur when each period of the lift cycle is optimized. Our design then should be one that gives maximum liquid recovery with an economical volume of injected gas. Let's see what that entails. The production capability of an intermittent gas lift system depends on three factors. The starting load, the efficiency of the lift, and the number of cycles per day. Let's discuss each in order. The starting load reflects the pressure at the operating valve just as the valve opens. It represents the pressure imposed by the buildup of liquid in the tubing. Field operations have shown that a starting load of 65 to 75 percent of the gas pressure at the valve will result in a slug velocity in the optimum recovery range. It has been shown that slug velocities of 900 to 1200 feet per minute are needed for optimum recovery, and this pressure difference will provide this range of velocities. For normal design situations, the 65 percent starting load factor is used. That is, the liquid is allowed to build up in the tubing until the tubing pressure is equal to 65% of the available casing pressure. The excess casing pressure provides the slug velocity. The upper limit of the design range, that is 75%, is used when there is a high surface tubing pressure or where there is a high gas delivery rate into the tubing. We can calculate the volume of liquid in the tubing with this starting load as follows. 
The pressure imposed by the liquid in the tubing above the valve is equal to the bottom hole tubing pressure, P sub T, minus the surface tubing pressure, P sub TS. Call this delta P. If we divide delta P by the pressure gradient of the produced liquid, G sub S, in units of PSI per foot, we obtain the height of the liquid column in feet. If this is multiplied by the tubing volume factor, F sub TB, in barrels per foot of tubing length, we obtain the liquid inflow per cycle, B sub E, in barrels. This represents the volume in barrels available for lift during each cycle. The next consideration is whether this liquid inflow into the tubing is totally lifted during a cycle, and if not, what level of efficiency exists. We know from earlier modules that as a slug of liquid moves up the tubing during lift, some of the liquid adheres to the tubing walls, and some becomes entrained as droplets in the gas phase. The lost liquid is referred to as fallback. We see fallback here during displacement in our laboratory model. Field tests have shown that a fallback of 5 to 7 percent of the starting load per 1,000 feet of lift will exist when the starting load is within the recommended 65 to 75 percent. As we mentioned earlier, these are the conditions when the slug velocity is at an optimum and fallback will be low. We see here that the efficiency of lift, E, based on an assumed loss of 5% for 1,000 feet, is equal to 1 minus 0.05 multiplied by the depth to the gas lift valve, D sub V, divided by 1,000. The term is then multiplied by 100 to give E in percent. If, for example, the gas lift valve is at a depth of 4,000 feet, the efficiency of lift, as shown here, will be 80%. This also means that the liquid produced per cycle, B sub T, will be equal to 80% of our starting load, B sub E. We now know how to calculate the volume of liquid produced per cycle. What remains then is to learn how to calculate the number of cycles possible per day. This number depends on the depth of lift as well as the length of time required for the pressure reduction and in inflow periods. The cycle time is usually adjusted in the field under actual operating conditions. As a practical matter, though, we may assume that the minimum time per cycle is in the range of one and a half to three minutes per thousand feet of lift. If we use three minutes per 1,000 feet of depth, that means that the maximum number of cycles per day, m sub c, is approximately equal to 1,440, the number of minutes per day, multiplied by 1,000 divided by three, times the depth of the operating valve, D sub V. If the depth of the operating valve is 4,000 feet, and we use the minimum cycle time factor of three minutes per 1,000 feet of depth, then the maximum number of cycles per day will be 120. When a system is installed in the field, you may find from experience that the ideal number of cycles per day is less than this maximum. This estimate provides a good starting point. It is through field testing that the appropriate cycle control is ultimately set. We now have a procedure for designing our intermitting lift system, or at least a means of calculating the system's maximum production capability. Let's take a moment to review the procedures. We start with the known well bore and fluid data and calculate the liquid inflow using a 65% load factor. Then we calculate the lift efficiency, E, Next, the maximum number of cycles per day, and then the maximum daily production rate. Let's apply this procedure to estimate the production capability of a well. We are told that the depth of the operating valve is 8,000 feet. The tubing size is 2 and 3 8 inches OD. The surface tubing pressure is 50 PSI. The surface operating gas pressure is 800 PSI. The gas gravity is 0.65, and the oil gradient is 0.40 PSI per foot. We wish to calculate the maximum daily production rate of the well under intermittent gas lift operations. We follow the procedures just described. First, we calculate the liquid inflow per cycle. 
To do this, we first calculate the operating gas pressure at the gas lift valve. The surface pressure is 800 PSI, and using an appropriate gas gradient, we find the operating gas pressure to be 970 PSI at the operating valve. Using a 65% load factor, we find the maximum tubing pressure, delta P, to be 530 PSI. This was found by assuming a 100 PSI pressure drop across the valve. With this pressure, our produced liquid should rise a total of 1,325 feet in the tubing before being produced. This is equivalent to a liquid inflow volume of a little over five barrels per cycle. Next, we calculate the lift efficiency. For a depth of 8,000 feet, we calculate it to be 60% on the basis of a 5% loss per 1,000 feet. With a 60% lift efficiency, we find the liquid production per cycle B sub T to be a little over three barrels. Next, we calculate the maximum number of cycles possible per day. For a gas lift operating valve located at a depth of 8,000 feet, we find it to be equal to 60 cycles per day. We complete our calculations by combining the production per cycle and the maximum number of cycles per day to give us a maximum production rate of 180 barrels per day. If our inflow performance calculations indicate that the well will sustain this rate, it is very likely a good design. Some field adjustment, though, will very likely be required. Before going on to discuss gas volume needs, let's stop the tape to allow you to work exercise 5.10 in your workbook. Now that we have learned the procedure for calculating production rates, we must complete our intermittent gas lift design. To do this, we must select the appropriate operating valve, estimate the injection gas requirements per cycle, discuss gas flow control at the surface, and make sure that we are able to unload the well. Let's begin with valve selection. The primary requirement of an operating valve used in intermittent lift is that it be able to pass a large volume of gas in a short period of time. From our earlier discussion on valves, you'll no doubt agree that this is an ideal application for the pilot-operated valve. Its large port allows a great deal of gas to pass once the valve is opened. A properly designed dome charge valve may also be used. In some cases, a fluid-operated valve may be selected, but because its port is small, it will require a series of operating valves opening in succession to propel the slug up the tubing. Now let's turn to the estimation of the volume of gas required during an intermittent cycle. Two-phase slug flow is a complex phenomenon, and it is difficult to calculate the exact gas volumes required. For estimating purposes, we may assume that this volume is equal to the volume of gas left in the tubing just as the slug reaches the surface. We may also assume that the gas in the tubing is at a pressure equal to the average of the tubing pressure when the valve opens and closes. The basic calculation of the gas volume required per cycle is shown here. P sub T is the pressure at the operating valve. P sub VC is the pressure just as the valve closes. V sub T is the volume of the tubing not occupied by liquid. And P sub A, atmosphere pressure, is used to convert gas volume in the tubing to standard conditions. We have not included the effects of temperature and compressibility because our estimate is approximate. Let's apply this equation to our example. We know that the valve opening pressure is 970 PSI, and we are told that its closing pressure is 725 PSI. The tubing length is 8,000 feet and we have calculated that the liquid fills 1,325 feet of it. The 2 and 3 8 inch tubing contains 0.0217 cubic feet per foot of length. The tubing gas volume then is a little less than 145 cubic feet. When we convert this to the number of standard cubic feet contained in the tubing at the average pressure, we find a value of 8,331 cubic feet, or about 8.3 MCF. 
This is the volume of gas required per cycle. We must conserve and reuse the lift gas in subsequent cycles to create an efficient production operation. We should now turn to the control of intermittent gas lift operations. Control of the gas passing from the casing to the tubing is provided by the gas lift valve. This control is complemented by several types of surface controllers. These may be provided by time cycle control or choke control. With time cycle control, a clock drives a pilot which opens and closes a diaphragm actuated valve on the gas supply line. The pilot can be adjusted to open and close for specific periods of time. A circular two pen pressure chart of a time cycle controlled intermittent lift operation is shown here. The outer line is the casing pressure. The inner is the tubing pressure. The V shape on the casing pressure record indicates when the controller opens, when the controller closes, and when the operating valve closes. The increases in tubing pressure indicate when the liquid slug reaches the surface. The choke control method relies on the inflow performance of the well and the gas lift valve operating spread characteristics to control the cycle. The surface control consists of an adjustable choke or flow control valve on the gas supply line. The choke is adjusted to admit gas continuously into the annulus so that its pressure builds at a steady rate. When the pressure reaches a high enough level, the gas lift valve opens and the slug is displaced. The choke must be adjusted then to admit gas at a rate compatible with the well's inflow capacity. An efficient cycle frequency is then established. A very important feature of choke control is that it eliminates the cyclical injection surges from the compressor. In effect, the choke isolates the cyclic surges to the casing annulus. The compressor operates more evenly and the gas circulated to the well can thus be measured more accurately. For the choke control system, this chart shows that the casing pressure continues to increase until the valve opens. After the valve closes, the casing pressure begins to increase once again. This difference in opening and closing pressures of the gas lift valve is, as we mentioned earlier, the spread of the valve. It is this feature of choke control that allows us to store in the casing annulus the volume of gas needed for each intermittent lift cycle. The gas lift valve spread makes a storage chamber of the casing annulus. We've mentioned a number of aspects of intermittent gas lift, but our discussion has not been exhaustive. We have not considered, for example, the procedure to be followed in locating the unloading valves. Because the intermittent gas lift design is similar to that for continuous lift, in that the liquids are U-tubed to the surface from one valve to the next, the concepts discussed earlier for unloading a continuous lift system are generally applicable. We have also not discussed the option of using multi-point as opposed to single-point gas injection, nor introduced chamber lift design. We shall leave these items and others to your further readings in the workbook and cited references. Now please work exercises 5.11 and 5.12 in your workbook.